uh, well, is a, a scary creature. That's basically what it is. I'm, I'm frightened to death of it. When they get their teeth sunk in, it's there. I'd say, if to, like I said, it's your finger or something, they, they bite your finger off or break it anyway, for sure. We've known them to uh, attack people, bite people. They'll, they'll bite hardwood broom handles in two. I've seen tear, almost tear timbers at a boat, wood, wooden timbers in a boat. They, but to get over that, they'll just make, you see splinters flying from it. They'll, they'll tear it up. You know, if they get your fingers, it's gone. They literally tear it right off before you get to move it because once it locks, it don't let go. In the vast ocean waters off Newfoundland and Labrador, there are entire ecosystems about which we know very little. Within these ecosystems lives a great diversity of marine species. From the microscopic to the great whales, all coexisting in a delicate balance. For generations, people have been harvesting many species that live in these waters. Some of them are very familiar. And yet, there are many others about which we know very little, like the wolffish. In the cold waters of Bombay on Newfoundland's west coast, there are many habitats that support a diversity of marine life. This is a spawning area for the Atlantic, also known as striped wolffish. Wolffish are large, elongated, long-living, and slow-growing fish, with a dorsal fin extending the length of the back and large fan-like pectoral fins. Wolffish can grow to be 180 centimeters and weigh as much as 23 kilograms. They occur in depths of up to 1,200 meters. The Atlantic, or striped wolffish, often called catfish, occurs from the Labrador Shelf to U.S. waters in the Gulf of Maine. It has a large head, large pectoral fins, and firm flesh. It also has vertical stripes along the body. The spotted wolffish, also called catfish or leopardfish, occurs from the Labrador Shelf to the Scotian Shelf. It is similar to the striped wolffish, but has dark leopard-like spots covering the head and body. The northern wolffish, also called broadhead, bullheaded catfish or jelly cat occurs from Davis Strait in the north to the Scotian Shelf. It has a smaller head relative to the body, smaller pectoral fins, and jelly-like flesh. Wolffish are so named because of their teeth. The front teeth are small and sharp in the northern wolffish, large and canine in the spotted and striped wolffish. Behind these teeth are molar teeth, and on the roof of the mouth, a plate of anvil-like teeth. However frightening these teeth may appear, they are designed for a good purpose. The striped wolffish uses its canine teeth 
to pry sea urchins, clams, and mussels from the ocean bottom. The large molars in the back of the jaw, combined with powerful jaw muscles, are used for crushing hard shells. The wolffish is the only fish in Newfoundland and Labrador capable of crushing the shells of adult whelks, periwinkles, and clams. Large fragments of shells pass through the intestines of wolffish and are released as waste material. Over time, a wolffish that has been eating shellfish creates a gravelly substrate, which is used by other species, such as young lobster, crab, sea cucumber, and polychaete worms. Each year, for about two to three months, close to the spawning period, the striped wolffish loses all its teeth. During this time, it stops feeding in order to protect the eggs. The striped wolffish is very docile. Its first line of defense is to put up a warning sign, a raised dorsal fin of brighter color. It may nod its head quickly or make clicking noises. A striped wolffish may even lie on the bottom with its mouth open as if to play dead. Only when severely provoked or when its eggs are threatened will a wolffish respond aggressively as a last defense. Fish harvesters know that if a wolffish is accidentally caught in fishing gear, it must be handled properly and treated with respect. They are strong and can be lively when they're under stress. Removing a wolffish from fishing gear takes great care. It's no wonder that wolffish have acquired a reputation for being aggressive. Striped wolffish eat a wide variety of shellfish, starfish, sea urchins, and sometimes fish. Spotted wolffish are slightly more specialized. A higher proportion of their diet consists of fish. The northern wolffish is the most specialized. It spends most of its time in the middle levels of the ocean, pursuing prey such as squid, pelagic species of fish, and shrimp. Wolffish will come to fishing gear of all kinds, crab and lobster pots, gill net, hook and line, groundfish trawls, and others. Many fish harvesters consider wolffish a nuisance. When I see a wolffish, he's probably in a lobster pot, and he got two or three lobsters to eat. So I was pretty pissed off when I see his wolffish. It becomes a problem for the fishing gear, you know. And in the crab pots, they tend to chew up the crab and eat the bait. And there they come again, tartar. <laughs> like, uh, there's no, good, no use to the fishermen, so we don't really want to see them. It's costing us money because it's eating our bait and, and probably tearing off all the crabs in there. We're losing, you know, to 50 or $100 for the crabs in the pot, plus the bait uh, as well. So that's, you know, when we look at, at, at a wolf fish, it's a nuisance. Yeah, years ago, uh, be, before, before, I, before I knew just exactly what they were or, knew, or were or knew very much about them, you know, a wolf fish, when I saw it first, I thought, well, you know, it's just another nuisance fish and it's probably ready there to bite your finger off or whatever it is. So we didn't really, we weren't really that particular over how we handle it. But uh, now I think, you know, because of the education and communication has been on the go lately, you know, now I think, well, you know, it's, it's there for a reason, I guess, in the food chain or, or in, in the nature's chain. And uh, I don't know really what to think. Sometimes I wonder if we should, be, should let it go or if it's uh, valuable or not. But anyway, sort of take the conservative side towards it. One of the most preferred foods of the striped wolffish is the green sea urchin. In some rocky areas of Newfoundland where sea urchins are abundant, up to 75% of a striped wolffish diet may be sea urchins. Urchins graze on seaweed, especially kelp. Kelp are large brown seaweeds that grow in long bands. Many kelps growing close together form a habitat known as a kelp bed 
and may be likened to a forest on land. A kelp bed is one of the most productive and diverse ecosystems on the planet. It provides shelter, food, and nursery habitat to many species, including fish, lobster, crabs, clams, and mussels. But sea urchins can be voracious herbivores, and masses of large sea urchins can cause deforestation of kelp that can be compared to clear-cutting a forest. If sea urchins are not kept in check, the area can become what is referred to as an urchin barrens, dominated by sea urchins and encrusting pink or coralline algae. In Newfoundland and in several areas of the world, scientists are discovering that wolffish are helping to protect kelp beds by controlling urchin numbers. This, in turn, benefits species such as cod and lobster. Without wolffish, we may be faced with more scenes like this along the ocean floor. We know far more about the behavior of striped wolffish than the northern and spotted wolffish. We do know that many adult striped wolffish during late winter and early spring move to inshore waters where they seek shelter in cavities formed among rocks and boulders. As wolffish move around to feed, they may use different cavities. One cavity may shelter more than one wolffish at a time and include other species such as cod or redfish. Here in Bombay, several dozen dens occur within about 100 meters of each other. During the summer, Male and female striped wolffish occupy nesting holes. Breeding occurs in the fall, when the female will deposit as many as 20,000 to 38,000 eggs. She leaves the job of guarding the eggs to the male. During this time, the male hardly eats at all. He guards the eggs fearlessly, such that it appears he would rather die than risk losing the young. Not much is known about what happens to young wolffish after the eggs hatch in mid-December. It is thought that they remain offshore in deeper water until they are close to maturity. For the striped wolffish, this can be seven to 10 years. Many people in Newfoundland and Labrador used to eat wolffish. The flesh is firm and white and tastes a little like cod. In Northern Europe, a commercial fishery exists for both the striped and spotted wolffish. Medical researchers have discovered antifreeze proteins in the blood of wolffish that enable them to swim in cold water at great depths without the risk of freezing. Scientists are studying how these proteins can be used in medical procedures for the transplant of human organs. Incidental catch or bycatch in fishing gear is thought to be the major human threat to wolffish. Bottom trawling, ocean dumping, pollution, offshore oil and gas exploration, and environmental change are being studied as other potential threats. During the 1980s to 1990s, Populations of all three wolffish species underwent substantial declines in eastern Canadian waters. The Species at Risk Act 
lists both the northern and spotted wolffish as threatened and the Atlantic or striped as special concern. Many fish harvesters in Newfoundland and Labrador who encounter wolffish disagree with this recommendation. Nevertheless, many are contributing to wolffish recovery by releasing them live in the place that they are caught. I don't depend on wolffish for, for a living, or, but hopefully in the future, if, if, this is, uh, if we live long enough, we, we, you might make a fishery out of it. And perhaps we don't see enough, and perhaps they're, they're going too far to, to see very many. In other places, like uh, on the southwest coast, those places probably to see more, and you might be able to make a fishery out of it if it came back in the future. Uh, you know, problem with most fishermen is, like I said, it's a nuisance. They're looking at it and saying, well, if I kill it, it's gone. I won't have that trouble no more. But if I keeps it live, well, I'm going to get it in my patch tomorrow. So at the end of the day, you got to educate everybody and tell them the reason why you're putting it back and what it's going to do with the ecosystem or, or whatever else. Or maybe in 10 years' time, maybe we'll be able to fish it again and there'll be revenue beyond it. If that's the case, fine. Oh, yeah, I think it's important to release them alive. You know, I mean, they got, they got a part to play in the, in, in, in the, in the whole scheme of things, you know. I mean, after reading and, and, and being educated a little bit on them, you know, they're, they're there for a reason to probably take care of some of the other species out there that would be preying on some other commercial species. So, in the end, you know, they're there for a reason. So, I guess it's important to release them live. Safe handling and release can save the life of a wolffish. In the course of a fishing season, the release of wolffish in the place where they're caught can mean the difference to tens or even hundreds of thousands of wolffish. The live release of wolffish is a license condition issued by Fisheries and Oceans Canada. DFO and industry groups such as the FFAW and Sea Watch Fishery Observers are helping to spread the word. The Government of Canada's Habitat Stewardship Program for Species at Risk and nonprofit groups such as Intervale are helping to engage fish harvesters in the dialogue. But when it comes to the recovery of the wolf fish, it is people like these who will make the difference. Yeah, yeah, oh yes, I think I think the wolf fish should tr should try to be looked after. I mean, wolf fish is wolf fish today, catfish tomorrow, capon the next day, and the main thing is education and trying to get people to see. I mean, how this affects the whole ecosystem and, and it got to be looked after. Same thing with every, every fish species should be looked after, whatever it takes. It's all put there for a reason. I can't see you destroying anything. I wouldn't fish nothing to extinction. I mean, that wouldn't make no sense. And, and me as a fisherman, it wouldn't, why would I do something like that? I mean, anybody do that kind of stuff, well, for a long time, not much of a fisherman. Uh, education is a big factor. You know, uh, you can't sell it. Let's kill it. That attitude got to go. Under no circumstances, political, for political reasons or for monetary reasons or whatever, to allow us to, to take too much of one species that ultimately destroy another species. Very careful. We need to be very careful of that. In specific inshore areas of Newfoundland and Labrador, there may be signs that striped and spotted wolffish are beginning to increase locally. There is so much we do not know about wolffish and other marine species. We do know, however, that fishermen and fisherwomen have a wealth of practical knowledge to share. Together, we can learn the best ways to conserve these species so that the delicate ecological balance is maintained and the tradition of fishing can continue. They had to be stewards of their own resource. They have to look out for it and they have to be interested into it. They had to preserve it for the next generation. And you know, you have to have everybody in society working towards uh, a sustainable fishery. You, you, you can't do it by the fishermen alone. The future of our own species and that of the wolffish may be more intertwined than we can imagine. It all depends on how we view these amazing creatures of the sea.